Welcome to Dev Jams. This is where we discuss amazing projects, typically done by developers, where they are innovating, they're doing just interesting things with media, typically images and videos, and of course, many times doing it with Cloudinary. And my name is Sam Brace. I'm the director of customer education for Cloudinary. And joining me for all of these Dev Jams episodes is Becky. Becky, glad to have you here again. Hey, thanks, Sam. Good to be here. So Becky and I, of course, we're very tied to customer education, teaching people every day how to be working with their APIs, how to be working programmatically when they're working with their media. And Kyle, the guest for this episode, he did something pretty phenomenal to the point where when we saw this project come out from him, it was one of the catalysts for us even creating Dev Jams as an entire program to say, there's some wonderful things that people are doing with Cloudinary, working with their development environments. How can we highlight those amazing developers? So Kyle, our guest for this episode, he's one of those amazing developers, and we're very happy to have him for this episode. Yeah, and he works for a company with a fantastic product because Postman is used by all kinds of developers, front end and back end. It's used for testing, figuring out how to communicate with your APIs. And as he points out in this discussion, it's becoming, if you're a tech company, you're an API company. And I think that this is our first look at someone who's implementing a completely API solution with Cloudinary. No SDKs involved. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those cases where in some ways I feel like we're a little bit biased because we are an API company. But yeah. I, I tend to agree with that statement. I would I think like probably our friends over at Twilio probably are also like saying, yeah, absolutely. But it is one of those things where, yes, it's showing the power of the APIs. And I think also just how people expect to be able to hook various pieces of software, various programs, various services all together through APIs. And that's exactly what Kyle has gone and done, where he knew that many of his team members were using Dropbox as a storage source. And he also knew that they were needing to streamline and consolidate the way that product screenshots were delivered and distributed amongst the teams of Postman. So working with Postman, which is once again, Becky, you said it well, fabulous tool, but then also working with Dropbox and Cloudinary how he was able to really create a good process so that way everybody was pulling from the same repository of all of the content they needed for product screenshots, whether it was for the marketing team, for documentation, for tech support, and many other purposes. Yeah, you know, he takes Postman beyond what I've ever known it to be. I didn't realize you could code in it, that you could store temporary state values in their environment variables. There are so many things, and then the ability to collaborate with it that with the collections that he shares. So I think this is an eye-opener for me and maybe even for some other developers out there. Well, excellent. And I, I agree. There's plenty that I learned about Postman along the way too. So let's jump straight into our interview with Kyle. And then once we're done with that conversation, stick around because me and Becky will have some key takeaways for you when it comes to what we learned and what we hope that you learned from this episode. So Kyle, for those in our overall audience that may be familiar with Postman, may have never even heard of it until watching this episode, can you give us some details about who you are and what you do for Postman? Yeah, so I'm a product support engineer at Postman. I basically query users for product issues or product questions, help educate and basically triage issues that could hinder users. So it's a small office space over here in San Francisco. So we tend to kind of branch out and see other orgs and help out where we can. So that's kind of where I kind of fit in working across teams here. Yeah. And you're a developer. You're going to show us some really neat things that you can do with Postman. What are your languages? What do you like to code in? Oh, me personally? I'm in JavaScript. <laughs> yeah. Like, simple. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, simple and everywhere. So <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it's one of those cases where I feel like me and Becky, there's plenty of people at Cloudinary that use Postman for many different things between our support team and our documentation team. Frankly, our documentation loves our <laughs> functionality of Postman. But just, just in a general view, can you describe what Postman is? Because like I said, some developers may have not heard of us yet. Yeah, so Postman is a collaborative API platform. 
So what that means is you can plan, develop, mock, and publish your APIs. I mean, mainly people use it as a, a REST client. So you want to make a request to an API or interface with an API, you can do that really simply. But on a larger scale, we are a collaborative platform. So your goal is to reach across your organization and align your APIs with your processes. And we do that through uploading API schemas, generating what we call Postman collections. And they're a collection of requests that your API can do. So basically a collection of uh, interfaces for your API. And from there, you can create tests, you can create integrations, a lot of almost low code solutions, as I call it, and as well as automate testing for them. So if you ever want to know if your API is working or not working. Another big use case I see coming up that I don't see a lot of API producers use is contract testing. So if I'm the consumer of your API, I kind of want to make sure your API is working well before I even test or release. So I can use Postman as a way to add tests for workflows that I need publicly and then Basically, the producer, who's probably outside of that company, can say, hey, these tests are failing. This is a consumer that uses that, so let's work on our API here. And then the consumer will see, hey, these tests are passing. That means I'm good to release. So it's a way to integrate. Definitely now where all of tech is basically using third-party APIs. It's a way to kind of organize and collaboratively work on APIs. And we definitely see that where, I mean, of course, those that know Cloudinary, our bread and butter is our APIs, upload API or admin API. So there are lots of different ways that developers are using Cloudinary's APIs with their various favorite frameworks or favorite languages. So it makes perfect sense why you were able to work on a solution that involved Cloudinary since you're API friendly and very focused on it. Same here. This is why I think what you ultimately did for your project is very exciting because it's very API first, in my opinion. Uh, you, you know that phrase, every company is now a, a tech company. Yeah. Well, I kind yeah. of believe that every tech company now is an API company or that's the way <laughs> it is. If I'm another company and I want to kind of work off what you built or anything, I expect an API. I think most consumers now expect an API, even if they don't know that's what they're expecting. So, you know, I had a job where I worked with some people with PhDs in English and they loved APIs. They were running APIs against large text to kind of figure out commonalities and, you know, so yeah, everybody, it's like the first entry into real like coding literacy. But, you know, one of the things is I've used Postman professionally for testing or in some cases, big end-to-end -end testing, but also just doing quick test. You know, can I talk to this thing? What do I need to give it? And then I might take that code and put it in my bigger app. But you're going to show us some things that I wasn't aware of till I read your article that you can actually write code in Postman. Oh, yeah. So it's not just about, you know, get and post. You, you actually have a, a full kind of node platform there. Yeah, so you can create on workflows. You can conditionally choose what requests you want to send next and stuff like that. So you can even loop. So if I want to grab something here and keep going and then grab it again and hit that request again, and I'll, I'll probably show it here. <laughs> yeah. We haven't got into what you're going to show us, but one of the things that you're doing is using our admin API, which we tend to meet a lot of people that use our upload API. That's kind of a big hurdle that you learn, but it's going to be interesting to see how the admin API can be used in this process. When you're working with Cloudinary, when you're working with Postman, as we know, we have APIs, you guys have a great way of working with APIs. It seems like there was a situation that was happening with your marketing team where you felt like you could build a project that kind of married our solution and your solutions together. Yeah. So essentially, I kind of believe in synchronization. As I said, I work in product support. So there's all these times where somebody's saying, hey, this doesn't work for me. And I want to say, you know, it just being an email, I don't have a visual. I want to say, hey, there's something here you can use. So I'll send a screenshot, add some arrows, and then shoot it over to them. But then everybody in product support does that, which is weird when you think about it, because the app, I mean, between versions shouldn't change, right? right. So one thing I noticed was, okay, we're using screenshots in our documentation, right? Our public docs, which is owned by our marketing team and our technical education team. And then 
we on product support are making our own screenshots over here. And, you know, I, I have some background in branding. So it's strange for me to point somebody to some documentation that uses like orange arrows and we're using red arrows. <laughs> and not to mention uh, the images on our website are optimized for the web. The images I'm sending are just quick quick shots. So I just thought it'd be easier and reduce time on product support. We could use these screenshots in marketing. And on the flip side of that is marketing isn't going to go through and take screenshots of everything a user needs. So that's where product support can pipe back in and say, hey, here's a bunch of screenshots we made. These are the screenshots users are looking for. And the marketing can use that. It just synchronizes the company, makes all our images look on brand and just reduces customer confusion. You're right, because in many cases, we see companies, I mean, I've worked at companies like what you're describing, where you have three or four different departments with best intentions, but they're all kind of creating the same material. And then we all look at it and it's like, well, why did we spend all of this time where we could have all just been pulling from one pool, from one central resource? So I like your idea about synchronization. It makes sense. It's highly efficient. So good job right away by recognizing a need. But how did you do it? One thing is I wanted to make sure that marketing got the say because we have a marketing engineering team that builds out the website. So they already make sure that all the images are optimized, on branded, they have to get them approved, you know, totally outside of the product support. Hey, I'm going to just screenshot and throw some red arrows right. in there. So I was like, okay, I want to use the marketing images and marketing should have a say on what looks good because, you know, I got hired here technically. I didn't get hired here creatively or you know, you, you don't want me designing your website or your, <laughs> your screenshots. So marketing should have that say of a single source of truth and be giving, you know, a thumbs up or thumbs down. And product support engineers, support agents, or just anyone who's using these screenshots, solutions engineers, pre-sales, they should be able to grab them without copy and paste or copy and cut or whatever from the marketing website, <laughs> they should have it easily on their laptop. So one thing is our marketing team was already using Cloudinary. Cloudinary is great. It already does the optimization. You guys have a whole admin interface for, you know, controlling everything. And then Dropbox was already inside all of our Postman laptops. It was the easiest way for me to try to sync everything. And it comes with its own API. Yeah. So that's kind of how I fell on let me try to use Postman to sync everything in using both your API and Dropbox's API. So where does Dropbox fit into all of this? Like who's using Dropbox and why was Dropbox a necessary component for this overall project? So, cause everybody has Dropbox. And so if there's a folder that we all sync to, that means if any changes in that folder means we all get it. So that's the way for everyone outside of marketing to get it, you know? I mean, Got it. they could go to Cloudinary and probably copy the URL and share those links. But you know, when I'm writing an email, I'd like to not have as many links there. I don't like the users exiting and you know, it breaks up the, the visual flow of my solution to them. Right. And your team had already built out a situation where if everybody has Dropbox accounts, you don't want to have to then suddenly transition everybody over because you've built a no new workflow for support. So it makes perfect sense why you're trying to make it work with your current ecosystem of various systems, various programs. So it makes perfect sense. You know, it seems like you've um, created an application that is used by a lot of people now in different departments and rolling something like that out could be challenging. Do other engineers like you create apps like this that are shared, you know, like kind of Postman apps that solve an internal problem? Oh, we, we totally do. We have tons of Postman integration. I think people don't realize like how much you can do with Postman. Even when I started at Postman, I was like, okay, yeah, I could send like, you know, interface with this API or the service. Oh, I could, you know, create some tests. But then when I started working at Postman, I started seeing what like people were doing with it. And I was just like, whoa, you could, you can branch out. You can, I mean, we even have a integration with Zendesk in Slack where almost all our Slack integrations are Postman collections, to be honest. Wow. So you could do like a Slack, a Zendesk and the ticket number and anybody at the company could do this and it'll pop up the necessary information for that person. So we use Postman ourselves quite a lot. Just recently, our engineering team is trying to go through and clean our own Postman team because <laughs> there's so many collections in there being used. <laughs> 
Well, just from a, a developer point of view, it has the advantage of not having to download a lot of libraries for SDKs. And there are companies where you're not allowed to do that. So you've got this nice thin little client that you can do all sorts of, of things with, you know? So. Exactly. So what I'm basically using is a Postman has this feature called monitors. If I'm a consumer and I want to run my automated tests or I'm a producer, I would launch them in a monitor. And that what that does, it runs a whole Postman collection on a cron job and then posts the results publicly. So I guess in a way, Postman, we're kind of hacking that, that cron job. <laughs> and so we're running these things automatically and then, but we're creating these workflows and, you know, it's very serverless though. So you can't store anything there, which is why Dropbox has this nifty feature called save URL, which is what I used heavily from the URL that Cloud Canary gives back. To be honest, if I had a favorite endpoint, I know it's kind of weird to say, but my favorite endpoint is the save URL from Dropbox. And nobody seems to really have it, but it's the most useful when you're trying to write low code serverless solutions, you know? Well, I'm excited to see it. Do you mind start walking us through this? Okay. So going to Postman, I guess I could start with here. This is the documentation I published for it. So if anybody wants to use it, they can go over here to the run in Postman button. And from there, you can import it into your native app. I'm on a Mac, so Postman for Mac. Or you can use it in this new Postman interface for the web, where Postman is completely in the web. I already have it here. It's basically the Postman app. The only thing is when you use this, you just got to make sure you install a desktop agent so that you can make calls and get past that cores issue that APIs have. So as I was talking about, there's collections. As you guys can see, there, I have a ton of collections here. And in each collection, you can see that there's a request. So you can see the HTTP verb here, get, post, post, and then I can come in here and name it whatever I need to be. But inside of that, that's where we get into the meat of what a request is. So here I'm saying this is a get request and here's the URL I want to get. So within this collection, the first thing I want to get is all the uh, screenshots that are in Cloudinary. So my thinking is, Somebody on marketing is in charge of the single source of truth of all the screenshots. They are an admin in Cloudinary. So they have uploaded all these screenshots in and made say, okay, these are the ones that are good to go. So this is kind of the reason why I wanted to pull straight from admin. The second reason why I wanted to pull straight from admin is because the other APIs have OAuth authorization, meaning I might have to send my credentials and then get a pop-up window where I finally sign into Cloudinary and then I can finally get an access token. It's very standard on like a lot of APIs, but because I'm gonna run this in a monitor and it's gonna be serverless and UI-less, I needed a way to authenticate without me having to physically be there. And with Cloudinary, you guys have this Cloudinary key and Cloudinary secret that I could just put into the URL and then this would just grab me all my images and resources without having to get an access token. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and that Cloudinary key is kind of like our username and the secret is like our password. So it's a familiar looking approach to authenticating an API. Yep, exactly. And like I said, there's no extra steps uh, that I need to get that access token. To protect those, so you don't have to hard code them. As you can see, I put these little uh, brackets here. That's a way to say, hey, I'm actually using a variable. And I use environments, variable environments. And you basically create something here. And then you can say, oh, I have a new variable Oop. here. And then we have these two areas. So this is important. A lot of people kind of mess this up because I, I think the name isn't the best, but we have an initial value and a current value. So initial value is what gets synced to Postman. So you don't ever lose your work or something if you're using the app. And current value is what you want to use if you don't want to use the sync value. So as you can see, sync just automatically went here, but it doesn't go back. So sync will be pushed to the Postman cloud. Sync one here, on the other hand, won't be stored anywhere. In this case, I didn't really care about hiding my credentials. <laughs> so I put things in sync, but if say you're a user and you want to use this, but you're scared of posting your credentials to a cloud or a third party, you can use this current value section. And that would make sure that nothing is ever stored outside of your knowledge. 
So that's where I got these brackets and that's how I could save the key and the secret. Environments are pretty important because that's how I actually keep and store data between requests. Like let's say for instance here. So just clicking send, I get all the screenshots that are in our Cloudinary instance. Let's see this URL here. So this should be the public URL. As you can see, brings up the screenshot. This one has the red arrows, <laughs> but this is because it's from my demo account on Cloudinary, not the actual Postman <laughs> Cloudinary app. But yeah, as you can see, I have a public link. You guys actually also return a secure URL where I think I have to authenticate, which is also amazing. And then you also have all types of info, like the format, version number, when it was created, all types of stuff I could use. You're going to be using environment, not just to store like your credentials, but you're going to actually put data into it as sort of like a, it's like your state. You're going to be able to hold on to data between activity, between commands. Yeah. So between requests, I can store data, a state in my environment. And the way this all works is because I have access to a Postman sandbox called pre-request scripts and test. This is where you can actually write node in that happens before your request is sent and then after your request is sent. And this is what powers workflows and testing in Postman. Most people obviously write their tests like passing or no. I'm using it for going through this response object, as you can see here, PM response.json. I saved it as a response. I created an array for screenshots. And then in the response resources that we have here in this array, for each screenshot, I created a temporary object. And there you can see I did the public ID and then I saved the URL. And then I pushed that into the screenshot array where I then stringified it and then stored it in my environment. Now, the reason why you have to stringify things is because Postman environments only store strings. You can't just store a JavaScript object or anything. You have to stringify what you want to store. And then when you take it out, you can parse it. Are those the PM dot and the SS dot, are those like built-in objects in those? Yeah, so you can see what Postman has in the Learning Center. It's our own Postman sandbox. So we have a range of libraries. Okay, so we have the PM object and we have a Postman object. Most people use the PM object for most of their things. That's where you can grab the response. You can even get the variables there. I'll show that in a minute. And we kind of use chai testing for anything like if you want to use any testing. People have gone kind of crazy with Postman though. And you can sidechain an entire library of something that you may not have. For instance, I wanted to decode some tokens and we did not have in our sandbox the algorithm. So I had to sidechain that. So basically what I did is I copied and pasted a whole JavaScript library and then put it as a a variable. That's really and then, it's a string, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then I evaluated it in the sandbox. So it gets really weird, but you can do some crazy stuff. There's a lot of collections that do stuff like that. <laughs> so um, the options are endless, but yes, everything here, as you can see, I do pm.environment.set screenshots. And you will be able to see screenshots. And now you can tell from my initial value from what's synced is none of that's synced, but it's all my current value. So this is only local to my machine. And as you can see, I have the file name and I have the URL to it, just like I created here. Well, so at this point, now looking at this, so now that you've gone and put all of this detail into the current value, is this now where Dropbox is being pinged or is it being connected at this point? Now, right now, you just have the Cloudinary images. Now, okay. I'm storing the URLs to them and their file names in an environment. So, going on, generally, Postman goes in the order of request. So, as you see, I hit get Cloudinary images. And the next request is check for duplicates. So, when I'm running this collection in a monitor on like that automated interactive list deployment, it will run directly to check for duplicates. So check for duplicates is where we start using the Dropbox API. Okay. And here, I, what we basically do is I make a request to list the folder called screenshots. That's a folder in my own Dropbox account. 
And that's where all the screenshots should be synced. And because this is a Dropbox app, every uh, user on the Postman Dropbox account should have a screenshots directory. So I don't need to, I think you, you were mentioning earlier that it's hard to get people to start using new processes of making things as simple as possible, because <laughs> that's the only way things ever get adopted. So another reason that I was using Dropbox was because it kind of automatically put this screenshot <laughs> directory in there and then they would have access to this and they wouldn't even need to do much, just sign into their Dropbox and update it. So once I make this call to list folder, now I have all the screenshots. So what I'm doing here is I'm checking for duplicate screenshots. I don't want to add what was already there. So what I do is once again, use the PM object to grab the response, turn it into JSON. Then I grab the screenshots that we got in the first request from my environment. And I parse that into actual JSON. I grab the entries from Dropbox. And then I do this mapping called in Dropbox. And essentially here is where I'm just grabbing the names. It looks pretty funky, but <laughs> I'm just splitting up and grabbing the file name. And then I make this unique array, which filters and says, hey, is anything in Dropbox box includes one of these screenshots? And then, so now I have a unique array. And you're basically doing a dedupe. You've got okay. a, a list of items that you already have, and then a list of items that you may or may not have, and you're fitting them together. Yeah. So now if these are both empty, okay, so I guess I have this new thing here. <laughs> so now I'm using this postman.set next request to null. So if my screenshots are empty, meaning I have no screenshots in Cloudinary, or my unique is empty, meaning I don't have anything unique and all the screenshots are the same, then I am going to say the next request is null. What that will do, it'll just end the request. It'll end the whole collection and meaning, okay, this is empty. There's no work to be done. Now, if there is work to be done, I explicitly put this one in here, postman set next request to the next request. I don't have to, because remember postman works in order, but I like to be very explicit about that. So say there's another request in between these two. I can actually skip over it by using the set next request. So you just simply put postman dot set next request and then add the title of the request you want to go to next. This only works at the end of all the code running at the end of the request. So you can't just, it doesn't automatically skip the rest of the code. You're just letting postman know, hey, I want this request to run next. Yeah, it's kind of a flow control thing that Postman gives you. So you're doing a sequential bunch of steps. They're all asynchronous. And then you're able to get in and do a little bit of control to end it or go on to the next one or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I think this is where things get interesting here. So now say I do have screenshots and I do have unique items. What's going to happen is I'm going to take that unique array pop it off, pop off the first item. And then I'm actually going to create a Postman environment with dot set and set that file name to save to. I'm going to save its temporary URL. And then I'm going to take all that, what's left in the unique stuff, stringify it again and save it back to screenshots. So I'm basically popping it off the environment here. And this is important. I, I see people pop it off here save it here and then forget to put in the new updated array. And then that kind of <laughs> gets people in an infinite loop. So this part right here is very important. And uh, you can see it here too in my comment. If you don't stringify, the environment will save a object object. Just uh, try to, we'll literally save that text. One thing I want to ask you about, Kyle. So I'm looking at line 13 here, and it has the temporary file name. You have .jpg. Is this a case where you are converting all the images to be JPEGs, or are we already coming in as JPEGs? So generally, for this one, I wanted to store everything as a JPEG. <laughs> but you are correct. I should actually be in grabbing the format here and storing it inside here. So but we wanted to do that. Now I'll have formats there. 
So that way it will stick with whatever the original format was. So if you had a PNG, then it stays as a PNG. Yep, nice catch. Okay, so. hey, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Improvements. Okay, so yeah. So let's just say we have something unique and it does all this. So now it goes to this next request, add to Dropbox. Now here I'm doing a, something a bit different. I'm actually saying the pre-request script here. Remember, this runs before the request even starts. And I'm setting the next request to, ooh, sorry. <laughs> this is an old one. <laughs> there we go. So I'm setting the postman.set next request to check for duplicates. I'm actually not say, trying to end this. I'm actually looping it back up top, right above it, to go back through and hopefully hit this code right here to get the next unique piece and then come back. Remember, uh, set next request doesn't automatically change. Like Postman won't see this and say, okay, just run the next request. It waits till the end of this request. So I was just getting it out of the way early. Got it. Um, so now here in my body, if you recall, we had saved the save to in the environment and the screenshot URL. Well, the Dropbox API save URL takes a path, which is that save to that we made. And then the screenshot URL, that URL is actually the URL that Dropbox is going to grab to and save into Dropbox. So like I said, this is all serverless because I'm going to be running this without hopefully interacting with it. Postman doesn't really have storage for monitors because monitors is built for testing uh, APIs with just pure JSON responses or XML or just text. So we really didn't build it with storage in mind for workflows. So this is why the Dropbox save URL is probably one of my favorite endpoints because now I can save any image, any video I want, as long as I have a URL to it. So this really, really helped me when trying to think of a serverless solution to this. Yeah. So you've created like a loop here with your check duplicates and add to Dropbox because yep. you're just doing one at a time, but then that pre-request is going to send it back to step two until you're done. That's how you do looping in this. Yep. So it'll loop right through. It's kind of <laughs> recursive <laughs> because if you do mess up, you'll know instantly because you'll get a bunch of screens of the same screenshot in your Dropbox <laughs> and this will <laughs> continue on forever. <laughs> and that's why I put this termination here. So this set next request null actually ends the entire collection. So if unique is empty and screenshots is empty or screenshots is empty, then it'll just end the collection and never call this next URL or this next endpoint. And really, if none of these images already had URLs to them, back to your point when you're showing this here, that's kind of the beauty of using Cloudinary in this way, because immediately when you put an image into Cloudinary, it's immediately deliverable. You get that HTTPS secure URL, so you can easily take that URL, then map it over to Dropbox from what I'm telling this build. A hundred percent. That's exactly why I loved Cloudinary. Not only did you guys already optimize our images for us, I didn't have to go in there and say, okay, I need to <laughs> get this FFmpeg or some type of image or video library and start optimizing. That's part of your uh, product already. And then you guys also returned the URL to it. And plus you guys actually have probably one of the nicest like admin interfaces. It's very like enterprise friendly. So that was a huge reason why we went with Cloudinary here. I loved everything that you guys returned here. You guys give me more information than I needed. Other probably would have just sent me the URL. <laughs> and and that's probably, it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I would probably still need to find a way to access it publicly. And they'll just try to say, okay, well now you have to go download it and then use it in your app. It's just like, it makes no sense sometimes. <laughs> so this was <laughs> the best and easiest way. And I got more information than I needed, which is always great. Cause I could always write improvements like how we just did it for format. <laughs> so that's amazing. It really helps. And then it, it fit perfectly with this save URL from Dropbox. So, yeah. And so at the end of all of this, now that we have the get, the post, all of this taking place in this order, once we get down to where you have the add to Dropbox test, then that takes that image and brings it into that Dropbox account in that screenshots folder. And so basically all the processes are done. Everything's good to go. Yep, exactly. And so 
now I guess most people are wondering like, oh, how, how do I test this? Do I have to build each request and then test at the end? No, that'd be terrible. <laughs> I mean, yeah. to just sit here. Obviously, I'm manually going through the workflow, but it's still me manually running it. It's not really using the set next request. It's just me hitting the send button. So Postman Runner is a way to run this whole collection on its own. So I guess I have to find a new way to run this. Sorry. I usually use the native app and the native app, you can go over here and then it'll say run and runner, but here you can just drag and drop, which is amazing. And then you can choose the order, but I don't want to mess with the order. And you can also choose what you don't want to run. Right? So I selected all this and I'm going to hit run cloudinary drop box sync. It's going to run all of that without me having to interface with it. It's a good way to test if your monitor is going to work without having to launch a monitor, which I'll show later. So I hit run cloudinary and it's saying, okay, it got the images. Then it checked for duplicates and didn't see any unique stuff. So it just ended the collection because of all the set next request equals to null. Got uh, it. You'd have to add another image to Cloudinary in order for it to find something new. Huh? <laughs> let's see. Let's go get these screenshots, right? Where is my unique? Yeah. Let's grab this. And then let's go here. Okay. And let's just let's just change a file name, right? So let's see, temp one. It's going to make copies, but I could go back and change that later. <laughs> temp two. And I still have my format. I still have my URL. So this should be good. So, I'm so make... is this the list that, of stuff that's in Dropbox that you just changed? Yeah. So that's a list oh, of okay. Dropbox. And then so... Let's do this. So I should see temp one, temp two. It won't see anything includes by file name. So then the unique array should be two. So then what we're going to go is go back to runner. OK, I'm going to throw this all back in. And what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to get Cloudinary images. So hopefully, it will use this environment rather than using everything in initial. Uh, so we'll try this. My hope is that it'll check for duplicates, have that unique array, and then call Dropbox, hopefully like twice. In your environment, you, you have a list of Cloudinary files and you have a list of Dropbox files. Is that right? Yeah. So the first request grabs all the images in Cloudinary. And I add all this context of info that I need. The second request pulls everything from Dropbox. List, list everything in that folder. And then it goes through and sees, based on file name, what's not unique in there, or what is unique in Dropbox. Can you do logging with this? So if I'm doing, like, say this, I could just do temp, so I know what I'm putting in there. Postman has this console here. And then if I hit this, you can see all the files oh, from nice. the yeah. there. So if you check your environment, and look at the files, you would expect that the one from Cloudinary was down to nothing at some point? Yeah, so like I said, right here, you have this unique array, and it filters based on the screenshots that we got from Cloudinary. And then we have this in Dropbox array that got all the file names that we had in Dropbox. And then so it goes through and filters out any names that aren't in Dropbox. So now we have this unique array full of just like specialized screenshots that don't exist in Dropbox yet. And then we go through that popping off a screenshot off the top of that unique array each time we store it to Dropbox. There might be some changes in here because we just released V8. So I got to just make sure all this stuff. There we go. And now oh, uh, nice. yeah. it's stuck on a loop, as you can tell. And then. <laughs> It got file name undefined because it popped off everything off the unique array. There's nothing left in there. See? Or in screenshot. Yeah. So that's a good test of looping here. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, that worked. <laughs> so I guess being explicit is out of the question now. But as you can see, without that null, it will just keep running on forever. <laughs> this is actually a really nice working environment. It's like doing uh, debugging in the browser with the console and that you can set breakpoints and log and all that. I know that we walked through the steps where we were showing how you built this all in Postman at the beginning. One thing that I think would be good for, at least I, I maybe I'm, I'm missing a step, is like how do you get it so that way 
Dropbox is communicating with all of this. Is there something that you had to do with Dropbox initially to set everything up? Yeah, essentially you have to go to the Dropbox app console. Okay. And you have to create an app, but scoped access, and you need to make sure you have full Dropbox access or you have an app folder and then you have to publish this app and then everyone needs to install the app. Like I said, make things simple so people adopt fast, right? Then you added a name and it needs to be unique, <laughs> which can be a problem because it needs to be unique across all apps. So I can't just do product screenshot sync or anything like that because I've used it before and other people have tried <laughs> stuff like that. If I go back here, you can see I created a Postman support. that I had to make sure it was unique. <laughs> Then when you're here, you go to your permissions and you give it the access you need. So really we needed files, content.write, files, content.read, and then files.metadata.read. I gave it some extra ones just in case, but that's all we really need. And once again, I don't want to go an auth, a OAuth role. I don't want to have to get um, asked for my credentials when I'm getting an access token. So the easiest way to do that was to come down here and generate an access token with no expiration. That way my monitor doesn't have to be updated. So then I generated this access token, which I then saved to my Postman environment. And when I wrote my headers for Dropbox, I did authorization and just normal bearer token. That access token I created is here. It was really just that. Even over here, as you can see, it does the same exact thing. And no, I just, think the nice thing about this is that it seems fairly simple from the Dropbox side of things to get this to all come together. And then as you're pointing out, as long as you're putting that credential into Postman, then everything else is, frankly, a unique coding that was taking place. But if someone were to try to duplicate your efforts, it's good to be able to see the steps that you would take with working with a Dropbox app. Yeah, 100%. If you, if you want to use OAuth or something in your request, Postman actually has this authorization tab where we have all types of ways to authenticate, you know, basic auth, OAuth. Okay. You can use those. But like I said, the main thing I was trying to do here was make sure I don't have to interact with the collection or have to post my own credentials physically. So this was the best way to do it was by generating an access token and then through Cloudinary's Cloudinary key and Cloudinary secret through the admin API. So once all this is set up, you can now create a monitor. And like I said, it can be collection oh, uh, screenshot sync. You select the collection you want to create a monitor for. You can select the environment, uh, which is needed. And then you can run the frequency, how often. Like I said, this is basically just a cron job. So I could run it every hour. I could run it every day or every Monday, every Friday. So. Generally, I don't have to interact with it. So if I do create this monitor. And then so now you have this little admin, uh, this admin UI for it. You can refresh it. You can run it. You can pause the monitor. You can edit it. So I hit run. And now you see that it's preparing a run and based on the success. And you'll get some results here. And then you can refresh on those results. Let's see what monitors I have, a token demo. And this is generally what monitors look like. So you can see how it ran how many times it failed. You click here, you can get that console log and you can see how each request did. Good amount of logging. Is there any recommendations? We work with so many different types of developers that have various levels of skill levels, various levels of expertise. Looking at something like this, where you're able to set the certain settings for a cron job about how frequent you were doing it. Is there any recommendation on how often you should be running a job like this? Something like a Postman monitor? Honestly, you can run this as many times as you like, but you have to think about your request and your code and what you're doing. So this is why I check for duplicates because obviously if something goes wrong, I'm going to have a lot of duplicates. And if I add to this every hour, it's going to, <laughs> it's going to add that same duplicate every hour if I'm not checking it for a whole week. So it's, it's how often do I want to monitor the screenshots in Dropbox? And I'm sure I could probably run this every hour. And then when, you know, anyone at the company can see like, Oh, Kyle, this is, having the duplicated image over and over, and then I can go back, pause my monitor, review my code and see what's going on. But honestly, I think ours runs every Friday. Okay. Like a, it takes a week for 
engineering to say, hey, we have this feature, product management to display it to the rest of the company. And then for marketing and everybody else to say, okay, this is how we should educate users. We need these screenshots and let's make sure they look good. Let's put it in the cloud area to optimize. So it's ready for Friday. <clears throat> I've got a question. Is it possible to call a, a collection from an API, like make a, an API call to it? Because we do a lot of stuff with async and we have webhooks and you call the webhook. And if the webhook could call the collection and just kick off the, another set of tasks. So this is where, yeah, things get very interesting. <laughs> you can create a webhook that runs a Postman monitor. So you first have to create a monitor, but then you can have a webhook that calls that post monitor. Yeah, because we have a lot of moderation queues and things, and you might want to like have something go off every hour and check your moderation queue and then go run a bunch of things to clear it up. So this is where, <laughs> where things of the UI change, and it depends on my own Postman plan. <laughs> I'm kind of running things here from my, my testing account. <laughs> so I got to see if I can even create integration here. But generally you can create an integration that will launch uh, a monitor. And all you have to do is basically give the ID here, which is available here. Yeah, that's really neat. This really opens up the door for a lot of interesting work. I was just curious too, like how do you go about learning when you wanted to learn about Cloudinary? How did you go about doing that? Oh, honestly, I just went through the docs. Documentation tells you everything. Um, so it's always best to go through the docs, even if they can be a little dry, but a cloudinary documentation, definitely for CLI reference here is what I used <laughs> is really good. I mean, other companies will show an SDK reference. Uh, some companies actually show the HTTP reference. So it's like language agnostic. And those are the documentation I like definitely when I'm going with uh, Postman. If you really want to get crazy and you really want to use a Postman monitor to automate something <laughs> and they only have the SDK, the only other option you really have with that is to go on GitHub, open up the SDK source code if it is open, and then check for those requests. Another thing you can do in Postman is Interceptor, which is it'll intercept all the HTTP requests that you're sending, and then you can collect those in a collection oh. and take what you need. That's a little bit more <laughs> advanced though. <laughs> <laughs> like run it, run the SDK, but just in order to figure out what the underlying API calls are. Yeah. And there's been tons of people who've done that, you know, so <laughs> that's another way you can grab stuff. If you're more into like less into reading documentation and more into let's break things and see what happens. <laughs> that's a <different> way. <laughs> and then if someone wanted to get involved with Postman and start doing some of the things that, where do you recommend that they start with? We actually have a boot camp feature. So if you go down here in the right corner, click boot camp, it'll actually show you how to start designing an API, how to start debugging and testing, automated testing, how to give documents, how to start with monitors and collaboration. Another great resource, uh, resource is our learning center. Honestly, this is a huge amount of like where I learned everything in Postman and you can go down and getting started. Writing scripts would probably be the most useful if you wanted to do like kind of stuff I was doing, making workflows, okay. automating them. Can you interact with this documentation or the boot camp? Is it like interactive code there? Yeah, so the boot camp is interactive. If I click here on boot camp, uh -huh. And then I say, hey, let's start learning how to design an API. It actually walks you through it. So you click through, mock server. And so you can do all the boot camp. It's pretty quick if you're a developer, but it, it's, it's really good even if you're not a developer. <laughs> it really teaches you a lot about Postman and APIs in general. Then, like I said, if uh, you want to, you can start reading about like how Postman works here in the Learning Center. Like I said earlier, there's an execution order of scripts request, respond, pre-request script gets ran here, test script, and then how you can start chaining requests or looping on them. And then if you wanted to learn more about the Postman sandbox, or we have everything there, like the PM object. Kyle, if someone wanted to keep up with you, like some of the new work that you're doing, or just be like, I want to learn more about all the things that you're contributing to the web and to API development and all that, where's the best place for them to follow? Medium is really good if you want to see some of my articles. It's just at Kyle Kalika ST. Another great place is Twitter. Uh, my Twitter name is Base2Neck, B A S S 
number two, and neck. So uh, those are some places where I post a lot of what I do in tech. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Kyle, this is amazing. Thank you again for taking the time to meet with us. And good luck with everything that you guys are doing at Postman. We're beyond excited that we're able to share all of this with our audience here today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. There's a lot that Kyle was able to talk with us about here when it comes to his project, about Postman in general, about just working with APIs in general. There's a lot to break down. So here are the key takeaways from me and Becky about this episode and what we feel hopefully you're able to take away from it. Starting with, we think you should probably spend some time looking at Postman. It's a fabulous product. We use it in many different departments here at Cloudinary, back to the point about streamlining and many of the departments using similar tools, Postman is definitely one of those. So I think taking the time, especially if you are interested in using APIs, if you're actively using APIs, it's a wonderful, wonderful tool to take the time and investigate further. Yeah, I think I really liked that he demonstrated how to authenticate an API. We do get questions about that. And many of our users are used to using SDKs, which you can authenticate via just environmental variables being picked up from your uh, environment. In this case, he shows you how to include your credentials right in the API call. So I think that's very useful. Yeah, it is. And it was interesting how, like, when we asked him, like, how did you figure out how to work with Cloudinary in this way? He pulled a lot of the details from the reference guide for Cloudinary's command line interface, our CLI. And so it goes back to that point where he's doing more like curl style commands. And of course, then he's working that into what he's doing with Dropbox and working with Postman to be able to do all that work with Cloudinary. So it's where, yeah, taking the time to investigate our admin API, investigate even the CLI for some of these things that you might be doing with Postman and Cloudinary together. There's some interesting synergy there. Yeah. And his in-depth knowledge of Postman can lead you into maybe wanting to develop your own Postman app collection. I think you could uncover a lot of things about your APIs and and then the ability to kind of iterate through work in your APIs and to manage data. I think there's a lot of good information on that. Yeah. And I think the other part that I'm looking at here when I'm thinking about Kyle is just he did something that I feel is so necessary within a growing organization like Postman, like Cloudinary, like others that are, you know, in a growing stage of being a software company is that you are going to have lots of different departments. You're going to have lots of different people that are trying their best and they have the best intentions, but they might still be doing each other's jobs. And of course, that's wasted time. So where he was able to point those things out and solve it with software, able to solve it with APIs, that's such a great thing to be able to do, to say that we were able to save time, save costs because of being able to develop a process or a procedure and doing it with these tried and true tools like Postman, like Cloudinary, like Dropbox. It's something that I hope more people see. And of course, it's not just utilizing those three tools. There might be other ones you're trying to hook into, like whether it's you have lots of details and spreadsheets and databases like Airtable, or if you're using tools that are specifically meant to hook one product to the other, like Zapier, whatever it happens to be, but finding ways to find those inefficiencies and remove them is a really cool thing that Kyle was able to do. Yeah. And then being a developer, you're not always involved in fixing problems with images. That might be something left to designers, but with programmable media, you have the ability to write code and actually get it so that everybody's using an orange check mark instead of a red check mark. It's so true. I mean, like there's been times where I remember early on in my career, we were running around saying like, who has a Photoshop license to fix that image? And we, <laughs> we don't have to deal with that anymore because if you're all using APIs or URL based transformations in Cloudinary's case, it is really easy to say those arrows that were added, remove them or change the color of them or add a different type of overlay to it. So everything is much more fluid and flexible. So I agree. It's once again, empowering the developer audience. And I think that's a wonderful thing because obviously me and Becky, we, we like developers. We, so it makes sense why we want you to be empowered for sure. Well, I think it's, it's really great to watch Kyle work through his code. I think it's instructive for anybody that wants to get into doing that with, and I, I know there's a bunch of collections available from Postman that can help you solve a lot of problems. 
And this kind of watching how he works with it can be helpful to learning how to do that. Absolutely. So a final few thoughts for me and Becky, of course, but now that you've gotten to this point, we want to say thank you. These episodes aren't meant to be short form pieces of content. We really dive deep into certain topics. So thank you for taking the time to make it all the way to this point. We hope you got a lot out of it. A few things to note here is that if you are watching this on YouTube or in the Cloud Near Academy, or maybe you're just listening to this on Spotify or Apple Music or Google, whatever you're listening to this or watching this, thank you. Make sure you're liking and subscribing wherever that is so you're always notified when the newest episodes come out. And of course, one thing to remember is that if you share any of this detail on your social media networks, whether you're a Facebook user, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever, feel free to ping us and let us know that you're telling people about our program. And if you do so, we'll take your Cloudinary account and raise it by one credit, which should help you out to have a little bit more wiggle room for your bandwidth needs, storage needs, or overall transformation needs. But on behalf of Becky, myself, everybody at Cloudinary, as well as hopefully with Kyle and the Postman team, thank you for everything. Thank you for being here. And we hope to see you for the next episode of Dev Jams. Thank you.